to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. It's episode 107, and today is September 24th, 2018, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Uh, we got some stuff to talk about today. Not a whole lot. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a shorter episode because we are hard at work preparing for uh, preparing for HFES. But uh, we're talking Walmart is putting 17,000 Oculus Go headsets in stores to help train its employees in VR. And, you know, as if it wasn't bad enough that we're taking a plane ride next week, uh, or I guess this weekend, airline passengers bleed from their ears and nose after crew forgets to pressurize the cabin. But first, I want to know what's going on in Blake's world. We got some stuff to talk about, right? Well, I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because <laughs> I don't want to get the, on a plane now. The timing of that was pretty good. I won't. <laughs> I won't lie. Could have been worse for two human factors engineers. Uh, and now everybody else that listens to the podcast is going to know. So if you're going to yes. HFES, don't be afraid to get on a plane because we want to see you. Yeah, we we do want to see you. Uh, don't don't worry about the pressurized cabin thing. That, that, it'll be fine. We'll be sure to remind our air crews to <laughs> pressurize yes, the cabin, please. Please. <laughs> please pressurize the cabin before we take off. All uh, right, but Nick. Yes, uh, it seems like we're having some some similar problems. I don't know if yours is a, is yours a problem. Uh, mine might be a problem. I don't think it really is. It's so my Fitbit I think is lying to me. Really quick, inside baseball, we both wrote Fitbit as our uh, banter this week. So your Fitbit's lying to you. I think it is. What What do you mean? So okay, you know, I don't know if yours does this. I'm making assumptions here, but at the okay. end of like when I have ten minutes left in the hour, if okay. I haven't hit X amount of steps for whatever it is, like I think it's sure. two fifty per 250. hour. It hits me up and lets me know, like, hey, you've got X amount left. Go do your steps. Sure. And so there's there's some times that I like to run my tests, run, run little tests on my little automated tools. You're a scientist at heart, so yeah. of course, yeah. And so there's been three times now where it's all, I've only got, like, 10 to 15 steps left. I'm like, okay, okay. I can all go right. do that. And sometimes I'm at home and don't want to get off the couch, but I get off the couch for these 10 steps. Or it's at work and I, like, need to quickly get back to my desk. So I'll, I'll count the steps out. But I swear it is accurately doubling the amount of steps that I'm actually taking. Hmm. I bet you that's because you have to get over a certain threshold before Fitbit starts logging your steps to make sure that that. you're... I I believe that's the case, right? Because it has to log a certain amount of steps before it actually says, okay, he's walking. Oh, he's stepping. Oh, he's stepping. (laughs) He's stepping. (laughs) Okay. Uh, so okay, that's the problem. I, 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 I think because I've had something very similar, right? Where I'm like, yes, I know I've made this many steps and uh, it, it just won't register until I keep walking. I and thought it just wanted me to walk more. And no. it was just telling me lies to get me fitter. No, it's still lying to you, right? I mean, it's not accurate if it's not. Because uh, if, you, if you walk, right, it, count, it back counts those 15 steps. So you'll, oh. you'll notice it jump ahead like 30 once you get to 30 or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly how it works. Maybe someone from Fitbit will be at HFES that we can ping. Yes, please reach uh, out to us. Yeah. Let us know. Cast. I've been having a different problem with my Fitbit. Yeah, so yours seems much more uh, concerning. <laughs> <laughs> Based on the language I used in the show notes, sure. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, over the weekend, basically what happens is because Fitbits have to charge, uh, you have to charge them. Okay. That, that's true. You're tracking. All yes. right. Is it this we're following so far? So you have to charge your Fitbit. So what happens when your Fitbit loses power is it will retain the last date time that it had before it lost power. Oh no. So as you can see, my Fitbit watch right now It is twelve thirty four. It is twelve thirty four when in fact it is actually four thirty five in the afternoon. Man, we need to go back to work. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's lunchtime right now. So here's the deal. I've tried syncing and resyncing this to my phone and it's still not updating the time. I've Uh-oh. tried updating settings. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it is having trouble connecting to my phone. It's just been, um, a blast. A blasty uh, blast. A blast. Like. What would to happen if you just out. let it die again? Uh, well, you know what? The scientist in me is letting that happen. Um, and yes, so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I've tried turning it off and turning it back on. So to that, I say, uh, well, you, you can see it in the show notes. I'm not going to say it out loud, but you, yeah, you, well, time is a construct anyway. It's fine. It is. Yeah. So, and, and I will just say the effect that it's been having on my schedule is weird because, uh, I don't know if it's elongating my days or making me feel like it's, uh, because I would think that having my time set four hours 
um, early or late for what is it? Four hours late. Yeah. Early. Anyway, four hours behind where I'm actually at in time would like make me think, oh, I got so much more time left in the day. But in fact, it's had the opposite effect. Where, I had too much time left in the day. Where, yeah, I've kind of been like, oh, it's 1230. Oh, it's actually, you know, 430. I have more time than I thought I did, which is weird. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it's working that way. It's weird, man. <laughs> well, it's too bad that like you've gone through all the steps to try and fix it. I don't know. Maybe reach out to him on Twitter. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've had so many problems with Fitbits. I think, I think, I'm not sure. Uh-oh. But I Are think, you going to do it? I think I'm going to go for the Galaxy the Galaxy uh, smartwatch. Uh, they have one? Yeah, it's really cool, man. I went to Best Buy the other day. And you have a Samsung phone, right? I do. So the ecosystem is there, right? And, cool. And I think that it would be... Uh, it, it, yeah, man, it's so cool. Like I got to use it the other day. It's uh, it's really neat. But I'll, I'll hold my full review for it until uh, I get one, um, and I can talk about it on the show. Epic. I yeah. like it. <laughs> hey, uh, so those of you listening, our listeners, are the people that listen to the show. Uh, this is going to be just giving you a heads up. I gave you kind of a little heads up at the top, but this is going to be a shorter episode. Uh, we do have HFES next week. I can't believe it's here already. I don't understand um, where this like time has gone yeah it's uh it's here already um so in you know we're we're heavy on preparation here on uh on our side of things so again it's gonna be a shorter episode we are going to uh, right after this there's not gonna be an after show party this week we are going to record an episode that's uh kind of a bonus episode but not really it's meant to fill the normal monday night episode that you'll get is kind of like a uh our survey of hfes 2018 what we're looking forward to what we can expect uh, what kind of cool things are going on at the conference? Um, I think we might drop that Sunday night, so that way anyone who's going can listen and kind of uh, get ahead of the game. If there's you know still some things that you're looking forward to, maybe even earlier. We'll see. We'll see how early we can get it out for you. But um, that is what's going on on our side of things. Uh, is, is there anything else we need to mention about HFES? It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to see everybody that's hit us up on Twitter and let us know they're going to be there, and then the interviews are going to be a blast. Oh, yes. We do have a ton of interviews. Uh, we are actually finalizing some of those right now. Um, I think we're going to mention most of them on our on our bonus episode, so be sure to look for that. Um, that way you'll have an idea of where to find us, who we're talking to, and when. Uh, I think it's going to be a great time. Uh, we got so much to cover there. It's going to be a blasty blast. Uh, and I'm looking for. I'm really looking forward to so meeting up with with uh, some of the folks that have uh, reached out to us. So, um, speaking of, well, I don't know where I was going with that. We're we're on YouTube. Go like, subscribe, do all that stuff. I'm tired of begging. I really, I really. <laughs> we're I, almost I like there. We're like, I don't know. Are we? I know. It's been a while since I, you liar. Yeah, what are I'm we at? Tell lies. I, I want to say now. we're like at sixty five. So, okay, uh, let's see so here. So we need like 35 left? Okay, so we're at 43. Ooh, so we need good. we need like 65. We Come on, guys. 65. Come on. We're, okay. just, we're so close. All right, that was it. All right, so yes, go, go help us out. We need that slash name so that way uh, we can see the way that we grow. Let me get into this really quick. The way that we grow <laughs> is by word of mouth. And so if you can tell your friend, hey, check out this Human Factors Cast podcast. Uh, you can go to youtube.com slash human factors cast. It really helps for discoverability. And if you like the show and if you want to help other people find the show, the best way you can do that is by liking and subscribing and helping us get to that 100 subscriber count so we can change our slash name. Look at him go. Look at that. All right. So I'm tired of begging. Um, sorry about that. I know it's part of the it's part of the show. I'm, I'm really sorry. I know you guys want to hear the stuff that we're going to talk about here with the news. So, Blake, what do you say we get into that part of the show? News. That's right. You got it right, Blake. It's Human Factors News. You did it right. You did it. This is the part of the show where we break down all the stories coming out of the field of Human Factors. This could be anything related to the field as long as it uh, relates to the field. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) HFES next week, folks. Look forward to that. (laughs) The field is very (laughs) ominous. So so, uh, what do we got up first this week? All right. So this week, the workplace training has long been considered one of the key early areas where virtual reality can make a dent in the enterprise. And Walmart has already made some noise when it announced it would be bringing VR hardware into its training centers. Now the company is planning to send Oculus Go headsets to each of its nearly 5,000 stores so that more of Walmart's employees can get instruction more often. 
The move is the <laughs> move is the evolution of an announcement that the company made last year that it was starting to work with Striver Labs to bring virtual reality training to 200 of Walmart's Walmart Academy training centers. Those training sessions were done with PC tethered Oculus Rifts, and now the move to the Oculus Go headset really showcases how much more simple the standalone headset hardware is to set up and operate. So Striver's instruction videos are largely 360 degree video based with interactive on-screen prompts and can offer employees an opportunity to see and feel like they're interacting with new initiatives before the infrastructure is even in place. So Walmart specifically highlighted how new store features like pickup towers for online purchases were up and running with much more quickly than usual because employees had already interacted with them in VR before they installed them in stores. So Walmart's going to start shipping these headsets to more stores next month, so in October. Nick, you've got to be super excited about this because this is like VR in a giant consumer setting. I'm very happy about this. Um, so, yes, this love them or hate them, have your political opinions on Walmart, I don't care. This is good news for the industry of virtual reality because now we're bringing these portable devices that have enough fidelity, that have enough sort of immersion to train employees on these processes, procedures, check out different infrastructure that they're putting into the store ahead of time. That's what they mentioned in the story is that they are now training on training them on these pickup towers and the big news here is that they are bringing employees up to speed before these things are even in the store. So if they identify some major workflow issue with the employees and have some sort of, um, you know, issue with, uh, like, let's say, like, th the workflow of the employee to do this checkout tower, whatever it is, there's something wrong with it. They, they have this insight ahead of time. So you could almost test a prototype. I don't think they're quite at that stage. I think they've already created the thing and tested it. And now this training piece is to, to kind of get it in the store. But uh, let's say there were some sort of major issue that arose when they started uh, issuing all these VR headsets out there and they started training in VR. It's very likely that they could go back and, and say, oh, hey, this is an issue. Why don't we just move this over here, change this thing ahead of the shipping time? Uh, so that's, that's really cool to me. Um, the fact that We've talked about VR a lot of times on the show and oftentimes industry or, or I guess not industry. The general populace will kind of conflate VR and video games and kind of think of them as one thing. But we've talked about VR and many other applications on the show where we've talked about uh, surgery applications, my, medical. Um, and now we're even seeing it in training situations where they are training a general workforce uh, but this introduces a whole bunch of other issues like what happens to the employees that have, um, you know, this motion sickness problem that a lot of people who get in VR have. Uh, there's there's a lot of issues to still be ironed out. But this, the fact that Walmart here is taking the initiative and actually using this as a training system is very promising. Yeah, and I feel like it's a good test case for Walmart and for, I guess, Striver. And then again, another use case. I, don't, I mean, again, I don't think that... Oculus, Oculus is very much involved with Walmart in this. I think that they're just purchasing these headsets from them. But it's a, it's good to know, like, how does this really pan out for people that probably don't interact with VR products very often in a training setting that's, like, for basically mass consumers? So they've already seen, like you said, there's been some already impact of being able to get a, a specific kind of, like, product checkout center up and running prior with a, lo a little bit less kind of rundown or any kind of problems that people run into. I think you make a really good point that although right now this kind of like Striver, and I'm not even sure if that's... I think like it's Striver. Striver. How Striver or S-T-R-I-V-R is producing this content is it's just very video-based. It's a play on words. Striver. Uh, gotcha. <laughs> Striver. Uh, but I, I think it's nice that right now it's just 360-based video, but I feel like over time, and I don't really understand the capacity that is a lot of Oculus Go, but if it's able to help start like recording actions or like how many times people mess up, you could really improve a lot of training. Right. Well, Oculus has these uh, these little control devices that you can use to manipulate VR. I know uh, I, I've never used an Oculus Go. I've used a Google Daydream, but they have something very similar where it's the point and click um, functionality, which which for process things is not terribly difficult, right? Like. Imagine training a cashier. You pick up the item, you scan it, and then you put it in the bag. And, like, 
even even though that motion is not the highest fidelity of motion, you're not actually picking up an object, you're clicking a button, you're still sort of getting that process memory, right? Procedural memory of this thing goes first, then this thing, then this thing. And I think that could be still really useful, even with just a, with a simple input device. So... Yeah, because even then you could really tell if, if, like, let's say a lot of people are having a hard time at the very beginning. You still get that good training effect thing yeah. that you can see through just trend data of, like, okay, people are improving quickly over time, so we don't have to worry about that being a problem within our simulation. Uh, I just think it's awesome that they're using Oculus Go headsets that just to try and do this. So now we're using something that's not tethered to anything. It's easy to slap on and quickly go. I wonder if beca- if the content that is being made by Striver is maybe maybe a little bit useful for people that may have these kind of like motion sickness problems right because it's it's using a lot of video from the store itself and then giving right. like some very small overlay vr type systems yeah and really the only movement is through the head it's not it's not uh the the directional movement that could potentially cause um motion sickness right uh some of the motion sickness happens when you don't have a one-to-one mapping with what's going on in your head uh, you know all the all the ear, all the inner ear, stuff all the inner ear stuff. Wire. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that that's when when there's a disconnect between what your body's doing versus what you're seeing. That's when that stuff happens. And so, yeah, if you're planted in one place, there's still some issues like with with uh, positional tracking with your head that could potentially make a risk. Right, if you lean forward, your head doesn't in that environment lean forward as well. Oh, you're right. Okay, um, so you're you're kind of stationary you kind of got to stay put uh for it to have maximum effect and to reduce motion sickness the most um but yeah i think i think this is great we've so we've seen this we haven't talked about this on the show but but striver uh has actually applications in other industries as well so um other partners such as chipotle verizon um and funny enough JetBlue. uh they you'll find out why that's funny in just a minute here but they have other applications right so um one example they give here on their website is Chipotle uh, actually gives an example of uh, like a like an I spy kind of hunt thing, right? Where you are trying to learn the layout of a Chipotle by pointing and clicking to these different objects in the environment. You can say like, oh, these are the trays that we serve things on and these this is the oven or whatever it is. Um, so you can kind of see those types of applications too, where it's just kind of learning sort of the spatial relationship of where everything is in the environment as well. How crazy would that be if you can cut down on some of the time for any job, but especially jobs where you're doing a little bit more like manual moving things around, you're cutting down the having to get familiar with the space time. Like you know where all the tools are located. Right. Just through like having homework before you start work of like going through this VR simulation set. Yeah, and not have to hold up a line when I'm waiting for my double chicken bowl. (laughs) Yeah, we wouldn't (laughs) want to do that now, new employees. But that I don't know, I feel like that has a potential to really drive efficiency of hiring new workers and having them like already at some kind of proficiency level in their job before it even starts. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it goes, the application goes beyond retail, beyond food industry. I mean, think about the application and in, in uh, some of these high intense situations like bomb defusal or something right EOD these are situations in which you'd want to train in a virtual environment before you get to the actual job um, and so there are a lot of different applications that have much higher stakes than retail that this could potentially transition into and I know there's been a lot of talk about potentially using VR for training applications but um, yeah, the domains are endless, and this is just one more example of how uh, we can sort of teach them uh, using virtual re- re- be- 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 virtual reality. Yeah, get it, looking at the kind of what they've created, I know that like Striver is using 360 video, so a lot of it's very high fidelity looking, and I know they put a lot of work into it, but it makes me want to get like an actual Oculus Go and kind of like tear it apart, not tear it apart, but get an idea of really what's what's going on inside of it as far as like hardware and software and then what experience it provides like right out of the box. Because it, it seems super powerful. I mean, just based off of the small applications we're seeing now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say it's not much, right? It's the Oculus Go. It's the Go version. It's the portable. It's not meant for high... Uh, environment rendering rendering capability it's it's uh very much to like play 360 degree video on uh which is just an all that's all you need for for this type of application sure. right so um yeah i don't know this is this is neat yeah, this is a great story i'm glad you picked this one out 
I really dig this. All right, so we have only two news stories this week, so we will be bra- back to break down the other news story right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Oh, I said JetBlue, and it's Jet Airways. Whoops, my bad. Didn't mean to throw JetBlue under the bus. All right, Blake, we got... Uh, well, before we move <laughs> on... track that. <laughs> before we move on to our next story, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch and Gizmodo for our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can join us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. We post those as we find them. Okay, Blake, what do we have up next? Just in time for HFES. Yes, Just very- in time for our plane flight to Philadelphia. Uh, just to unsettle me a little bit more. All right, so passengers on Jet Airways Flight 697 from Mumbai to Jaipur, India, recently had a terrifying experience after the crew forgot to pressurize the cabin. Oops. Dozens of <laughs> dozens of passengers on the flight last week started bleeding from their ears and nose in a complete panic as they were gasping for air. It's not something that we often think about on airplanes, but you need to pressurize them so you can actually fly on these higher altitudes. So a passenger actually expressed anger through the incident on Twitter, saying that there were no instructions from the cabin crew about using the masks after it was clear that something was terribly wrong. The air crew itself was actually that was involved in this problem was reportedly taken off duty until an investigation can be completed. All right, Nick, so there is a lot to unpack in this little story here about this small Jet Airways flight from Mumbai to JP here. What do you think initially? My first thought was, okay, what procedural thing got messed up here? Like, what what didn't happen to make this happen? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I don't know much about the processes from the flight crew to, like, what happens for pressurization. I'd imagine it's some sort of automated process, which is why this was so surprising to me. Um, and so I did reach out, you know, in our, in our, uh, Slack channel, because we do have an aviation expert, our, our, our good old Mateo over there, um, to ask him his kind of thoughts on this story. And, uh, I'm going to just read here a couple of his notes here. So, so he says from an organization perspective, it doesn't sound like jet airways is doing too well business wise currently with the cost cutting and trying to bring passenger fares down, um, so pilots tend to suffer the most from these things because they have complex workloads and schedules to keep up with. Uh, but for the pressure, pressurization, um, which he posted a great background on aircraft pressurization, I highly recommend anyone go read that. It's it's actually a really fascinating read, um, and I, I learned some stuff from reading it. So uh, let's see here. I'm trying to th- see if he posted anything about pressurization and what... Uh, potentially went wrong here so uh let's see here cabin control pressure is enunciated with a green light um from the systems manual and he went he went through the effort of actually digging up the air systems manual for the 737 this guy's awesome i love mateo he's He's, the man he's the man all right so uh he also writes i suspect this is what happened having not switched the system to auto mode which is what should be set unless having to conduct certain maintenance procedures or in case of emergencies and other events where pressure requires manual control or simply no air pressure at all uh he says all this with a grain of salt without being in the cockpit at the time and until further information is released. This is the simplest explanation. So Occam's razor. So with that being said, we, we, I, I don't know. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't do a follow up on this. I don't know what the status of this is. Um, I guess we can do a quick Google search to see. We can check it out, but yeah, I mean, likely happened. it's going to take some time, right? Cause all uh, from our perspective, I mean, a lot of reports like this, it just, it takes a lot of time to go through the process and procedures. You're going to interview everybody on the plane, do actual, you know, mechanical checks of the plane and see what was going on at the time. 
uh, I would assume, reviewing whatever's going on in some of the different recording procedures that are actually being set up on the planes, too. Um, but it, I thought it was it was important in some ways to bring up that it. I'm not completely sure if this is an automated process or not, and I'm kind of surprised that it, if if it is not currently in this particular set of set of aircraft, then why it isn't? Because it feels like this is something that, with the chaos of trying to get people on a plane seated, ready to go, taxi, and get in the air, it could, this could happen more often if it's if you're only relying on somebody else's kind of like you know, mental capacity to remember this is part of their job or correct resource, like crew resource management. Right. Um, so I, I guess that ultimately, I, one, I'm not sure and I'm not an aviation expert if this is an automated process. And if it's not, then why it isn't? Because it would just, it seems like it would save these kind of problems from happening. Right. Well, if you read that article that Matteo posted, he actually, it actually gets into some of yeah. why, why air pressure is different. Um, in different altitudes, sometimes you need to manually control it. Sometimes it is an automated process. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting read. I highly recommend. I just want to bring up. So there's been a official an official statement from Jet Airways. They say following the air turn back of Jet Airways flight nine W nine sit whatever the on September twentieth, twenty eighteen, one forty four. The one sixty six guests of the original flight traveled to Jaipur uh, via an alternative Jet Airways flight, while seventeen of them wish to travel at another point in time. Who can blame them? Five guests who were referred to a hospital for additional medical check-in accompanied by the Jet Airways care team have since been released. Post-medical examination, we will continue to offer necessary medical care and attention to the concerned guests as required. We are also extending full cooperation to the DGCA for ongoing investigation of the event. We regret the inconvenience to cause to our guests. So I want to bring up one additional point after this. They are talking heavily about the medical um, attention that is given to the passengers here. That's another thing that a lot of the passengers of this flight were complaining about is that there was no clear direction as to whether or not they should use the air masks or or what to do in that situation. And I think largely that is due to the fact that this is not a frequent event. This, you know... Yeah, this and is so, definitely a one-off occurrence, right? It's not something you're have, you're hearing about every day or that we really have problems with it out then. Right, so I, I would imagine the staff don't really know how to deal with this, right? Like, do, do, I mean, it is one thing to, to kind of say, yes, put those masks on. That's what you're supposed to do, right? If, if the masks come down, presumably, you should put them on your face. Uh, <laughs> like, I would put it on my face if the masks came down. Let me just say that. I don't... <laughs> yeah, it would be on. I'd be, like, closing my eyes and probably freaking out. Yep. But I'd still uh, have it on. Calling my least. loved ones, yep. And, and at least I could breathe. But the the thing is, like, how much more would it take to invoke some sort of automated system? Again, automation for, like, when the masks come down to say, please... The instructions. Please place the masks over your face first, and then the child's face, so that way they get air. You know, all that stuff. How hard would it be to automate some sort of... Uh, and I know, in a panic situation, like, apparently everyone was panicking. Um, and so it's it's a little bit trickier when, when you know, you're, you're faced with a potentially life-threatening situation where you're bleeding from your ears and you don't know what's going on. Uh, I'd imagine the crew is bleeding from their ears as well. Yeah, I mean, the and, only thing you could do in that situation is either look to the people around you and pick up cues that way. But again, this is panic and chaos. And oof. then you might have to rely on if you can see somebody that's a crew member and seeing what they're doing. But again, you might not be able to see that person. So it's it's almost like you have to err on the side of extreme caution. Like if these masks appear, you have to put them on. Yeah, there is a Twitter video. And, uh, it the, you know, the article says panic, but I mean... It's hard to tell in the Twitter video that people, um, you know, I don't, I don't see panic personally, but I mean, think about what kind of situation this is. This is really sort of stressful. Like this is, uh, it's, it's, it's I gotta kind say, of surreal. Yeah, it, it definitely is. It's very surreal. But if somebody has enough cognizance to be able to like take a video it, and that, and we're watching it right now, it's pretty slow or it's pretty smooth action, you know, sw- swiveling around and looking at it. So maybe it wasn't as bad as being as it's being advertised. Still very terrifying. Very terrifying, especially when we're one week away from taking a plane flight to HFES. Yes, and Blake already gets anxiety <laughs> from flying, so it's yeah, be great. You know, talking about this article is giving me a lot of anxiety myself too. Like I don't know about you, but this is this is uh, really kind of triggering my anxiety about flying. And uh, you know, I don't know. 
It'll be all right. Yeah. So the, I guess the way <laughs> the, the way I wanted to tackle that was I didn't I didn't want to immediately assume that it was like a crew resource problem, right? If it was indeed like an automated right. situation, but it sounds like from Mateo's take on it and the article he provided us with that it's a it's in de, it depends situation depending on like why why it may have been off or what may have been going on because it sounds like you have different you interact with the pressurization of the cabin in different ways depending on what's actually going on in the air. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. Uh but I will say to anyone who's interested in following this information, Mateo has posted a lot of really valuable resources to the all of the the Jet Airways fleet uh to this pressurization background to the manual system manual the boeing 737 he's great he's got a lot of resources up there so i'd highly recommend go go check those out and thank him for doing all that um well i'll be reading all of them before we get on a plane on sunday oh okay well i was gonna read them while we were on the plane i read the pressurization one but the the system manual that'll that'll make some nice light reading yes (laughs) some nighttime reads all right uh blake any closing thoughts on this one before we move on I'm not as terrified as we were when we started. So okay. It's yeah. Good. You know what? If if uh, pressurization doesn't happen, then you know at least it'll be kind of calm. You'll be bleeding from the ears, but at least you'll be calm. Yeah. Right? Be under pressure. All right. Well, it's that time again. What time? It is came it? from. It came from. Let's switch gears and get to it came from. Well, not Reddit this week. It's Twitter. It's Twitter. This is the part of the show where we search all over social media. We're going to switch it to social media this week uh, to bring you topics the community's talking about. Uh, anything's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. And what better way to interact with the community than from a direct tweet from uh, Tori Mortensen. So this one is, this one was in response to our, do you have any questions about human factors? We ask every Sunday, you know, we never get any hits. And then here's, here's Tori. Thank you, Tori, for writing in. Uh, he says, sorry if it's already been done, but maybe a careers cast. Tell your human factor story and maybe give advice to new entrants. Also, what would you recommend HF people, that's human factors folks, uh, that are place bound in a rural area, do career wise, uh, remote, et cetera. So Blake, I want to tackle this in two bits. So, First, let's tell our human factors stories. The origin um, stories. Yeah, we've 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 mentioned these on the show before, but I mean, it's always good to kind of revisit these for for some of our newer listeners. Sure. We're always we're always getting new listeners. So, hey, if you're new to the show, welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, you're about to hear our origin stories. So, Blake, go. Yeah, here we go. So, I'm going to keep it short. I'm not going to do like a full elongated version, but. So I, I went to college originally to be an aerospace engineer. We've talked about this before. That didn't really pan out because I'm not so good with some of the numbers, some of the uh, your physics and whatnot. It's oh, really, yeah. I really struggle with. You're the reason for the air decompression, right? Yes, okay. I'm the reason because it didn't turn that on. No, <laughs> I, so I actually just really got into psychology. So I was very excited about neuroscience, and I worked in a, la- a rat learning lab. and wanted to combine those two things. Uh, but when it came to applying for PhD programs, by the time I was graduating – my undergrad, I just wasn't really excited about either one anymore and couldn't see like going and pursuing a doctorate in something that I wasn't super stoked on. Uh, my professor at the time who was looking over me, Dr. Martha Escobar, if you're watching. Shout out. Uh, she actually mentioned, because she knew I liked to work on cars and I liked working on mechanical things and stuff like that, that had I ever heard of human factors. And she also knew I had some interest in aviation, had like a background in aviation engineering as well. Um, and so she pointed me in the direction of this particular program in Long Beach that kind of put both together. So they dealt with, you know, ATC development of new stations through like new technologies and stuff like that. And then also applied human factors methodology. So that, that's kind of how I got into even knowing about human factors. And then I did, a, did my undergraduate work or graduate work, I guess, at this point in human factor psychology. And now I'm here. And now you're here. No, I'm here. And then, and then a wide-eyed uh, young man asked you if you'd like to be on a podcast, and, and now you're Yeah, here. and now I'm here, yeah. Okay, all right. That's your origin story. I got bit by a radioactive uh, human factor spider. Oh, good. Uh, no, so Is that my, how you got here? <laughs> that's how I got here. My origin story um, that's not contagious. was, well, I was classically trained in social psychology in my undergrad and had never heard of human factors, wanted to do some research in the vein of virtual reality, but wasn't really... Uh, happy with some of the social psych research coming out of it. And so I thought, you know, what what are some other applications? Um, and my advisor at the time recommended human factors and that I look into human factors programs. Uh, and, you know, eight out of the 10 programs that I applied to were social psychology programs. And I didn't know that. Yeah. So fun fact. Uh, and then, you know, it's funny the way life takes you. I, I got accepted um, 
into a human factors program and and it was competitive it was competitive for uh, uh stipend and all that stuff so i i decided what the hell you know let's go for it and uh i got there and i realized that you know everyone was kind of talking my same language i didn't have to describe what an hmd was i didn't have to describe what uh occlusion was i didn't have to describe what any of these other terms that we throw around are and i found it very refreshing and so much so that i pretty much fell in love with the thing and the, the the topic, not the HMDs or whatever, but I fell in love with the topic of human factors and uh, occlusion. And uh, you know what? One thing led to another, and and uh, you know the love the love fostered, and 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 uh, here I am. Yeah, and then you started the podcast, and then I started the podcast. Yeah, he's the man. Uh, well, I, I, the reason for the the genesis of the podcast was, um, well, I like podcasts, and I was looking for human factors podcasts, and I didn't see any human factors podcasts and i thought that was a uh need that someone needed to fill and damn it that's that's something that i want to do so well, what better excuse to than to talk about the thing that you love every week yeah yeah and the, the, then the evolution is of course where it is now but yep yeah it's been yeah. a fun road so that's our origin stories if you will let's get into part two of this question what would you okay you know what maybe give advice to new entrants let's let's tackle this too because i don't want to this i don't want to overlook this yeah you're right Okay, new <laughs> We were going to skip it, but... It <laughs> so, okay. This is kind of tough for me to know where to start or where to, like, target my... Let's see, my advice, because a lot... I didn't know this, and maybe maybe you'd heard of this by the time you'd heard about human factors, but there's, there's programs out there that already exist that are, like, undergraduate psychology degrees that are yes. human factors. I, I knew that. Yeah, see, I'd never even heard of that until I went to grad school. Right. So, it, it, let's say... I don't know. E- really, either way, if let's, you're... If let's, you're Let's break it down from like two entry points. Two one, one, you're an undergrad. Two, you're looking for graduate school. Because I feel like those are two um, what, new entrance uh, entry points for human factors. I feel like um, those are two good places to start. So why don't we break it down by that? Sure. Uh, so if, if, if I could do it all over again and I was coming at it from an undergrad perspective and I knew that there was a way for me to get a like a BS in human factor psychology, I would have totally done that because you would have like a leg up on hopefully a lot of methodology and then also a lot of the background bits that you're going to get a little bit in grad school um maybe a little less uh maybe maybe a little less of the psychology maybe i don't know what it would, what it would fo- focus on at an undergrad level but i would definitely take the time in undergrad to really hone in and understand like what you like about the field and try and see if you can like branch out and either put yourself in classes that are more technology based stuff that's like cs related or if it's if if in this this day and time if it's vr related or even if you really fancy yourself doing more design work putting yourself in kind of those shoes i mainly what i'm trying to say is get the solid basis for what you're going after as like a a main degree but kind of diversify yourself and try and make sure that you're getting like extra classes that are related to technology or fields you might work in Sure. I, so I'm going to be weird about this answer. So I feel like the the undergrad is to kind of survey the breadth that academia has to offer. Uh, and for that reason, if you're already listening to Human Factors Cast, chances are that you are interested in the topic and you want to pursue it, and that's great. Um, but I had sort of a lot of growing pains in my undergrad because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I got to grad school that I realized I loved human factors. Sure. Um, and you know, I, I didn't even know it was a field until my advisor had suggested it. And so what I would say is do, do whatever in undergrad, um, and discover yourself. And honestly, like that, I, that feels like a cop out, but it's not because you can direct your education in undergrad in ways that you cannot in your, uh, graduate studies. Very so, true. So you can take those CS classes. You can take uh, social psychology classes. You can take clinical psychology classes in your undergrad that you may, you get that survey, right? I took an archaeology class in my undergrad, uh, which is kind of like the psychology of history, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what people did by looking at their trash. And so the, the breadth of undergrad is a great time to explore. Now, if you find something that you love better than human factors, then great, go pursue that. Um, if you find that you absolutely love human factors, then you can do it in the graduate program. Like that's that's kind of my two cents. I know a lot of people who get into human factors after pursuing something else in their undergrad, 
<laughs> and they're doing fine. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people took that route. And yeah. sometimes they didn't even, or from my experience in the grad program I went to, some people didn't even have a background in psychology necessarily either. Right. Design, engineering, a couple of different. Yeah, like a wide locations. variety of people. Yeah. So like the there was like a focus of okay, you have to meet these requirements of take all these psychology classes, right. which is tough on top of you know a grad school coursework. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, it it allow, I think you I think what you've said is perfect. Like really figure out and let yourself explore things when you're in undergrad, and don't don't be like freaking out that oh I don't really know what I want to do with my life or where I want to go because oh. you, you might figure it out at the end or somebody yeah. like for Nick and I. It's like, hey, try this thing. Yeah. You know what? I, th- there is a common thread, though, between both your experience and mine is that we had an advisor that cared. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I would recommend above all else. Get yourself involved in a lab because they oftentimes, meaning your advisor or, or whoever the PI in the lab is, they have oftentimes a much broader idea of what's out there and and if they're any good at being an advisor, they can help you sort of hone your interests and guide you into uh, basically a placement that's right for you. And you, now that I'm thinking about it, and maybe this is just, maybe this is something me being super introspective and like a retrospective of what I'm so thinking about school. But I, th- I think that experience of having to be in a lab and like the the like last minute freak out for me or the last year I'm there and I will also realize that like, for psychology, I would probably want a master's degree or a, P- or a PhD, and I had been in a lab. Uh, but getting into one really taught me a lot of probably the business skills that I have now and a lot of the social cues for the business world that I may not have had when I walked into my first job. Sure. Because you, like, you couldn't show up to lab meetings late. You couldn't show up to lab meetings without having you know done the work right. to uh, like, talk about the stuff, then... or else you were going to get reamed, and it was like your your first real getting in trouble in front of like your peers. Because yeah. in class, is whatever, it's 500 people. But in this setting where it's like somebody who's trusting you to help their PhD students do the work. Intimate, in some cases, like five-person group. Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I think yeah, it's exactly or like two right. to three person group. I've had those too. Yeah, so much it, more. And I think it, it helps you foster a relationship with somebody who's been in the field long enough that can you know give you insight into where your career might lead you or where you might want to try taking your career. Yeah, and it's always hard. Um, the, the The hardest step is actually approaching somebody to ask them to be in a lab. But honestly, uh, from my experience, you know, knocking on somebody's door and saying. Hey, do you want an extra body in your lab to help you do all this data analysis or, or data collection? Um, you know, unless they're not running a whole lot of stuff, they're going to be hard pressed to say no uh, to someone who's so eager. So I don't, I don't know. That's just my experience. So. And know. on that <laughs> note, I do want to throw a comment out there in case somebody runs into the same thing that I did. I got denied from every lab that I asked to join until the very last one. So well, of course it would be the last one because yeah. that's the one that. So, well, yeah, that was, the last. <laughs> and it wasn't the last person in town to ask either. Like I had four people and I like went down the line of people to ask and like I couldn't yeah. get into a lot of the labs. You know, what? I let it discourage me for weeks and weeks. I love the, this discussion because we just keep uncovering more stuff because funny enough. OK, so my advisor was actually uh, my, my graduate advisor actually taught at my undergrad institution and I had applied to his lab because I had heard that he was doing virtual reality research and, and uh, cognitive perception. And I thought that was really interesting and wanted to be involved um, at the recommendation of some of my colleagues. And uh, so I applied and he said flat out, no, I'm not taking students. And then uh, I applied to graduate school to study under him. And he says, yes. And I don't know. I, I consider him a, a friend and colleague and is a, uh, is a great time. That's pretty so, awesome. Yeah. yeah. It was a shout out to Dr. Russell Jackson. There you go. Yeah. Dr. Jackson, powerful Dr. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Jackson. Okay. So we have one more piece of this puzzle and this probably one, the biggest piece. I this guess. Is, yeah. I guess we're just unraveling this onion so much. I don't even think we need Reddit this week. Honestly, Blake. So. No. Yeah. We would, we <laughs> talked further about this one than I ever expected. I, yeah, me too. Okay. So this third part here, what would you recommend human factors? People that are place bound in a rural area do career wise. Should they do it remote, etc.? Um, so Blake, I know you have some experience freelancing 
and you've done that remotely. And so I figured that's a good place to we can start, and then maybe we can unravel this onion like we did with the advisor onion. God, I love onions. Uh, uh, so I'm actually going to take a different. I'm going to take two approaches. I'll talk about what Nick just mentioned. Like I do have experience freelancing doing remotely, but I, I would also for this specific case, Tori, if you are living in a place and you feel like you're place bound, um, kind of survey the town or place that you live and get a sit. Cause I'm assuming maybe, maybe it's small enough. You actually know a lot of people or know all the businesses in town, but from, from your expertise, is there some gap that you can fill in what's going on in the business world that exists in your town from a human factors perspective? I mean, could you help people with distribution in a way that, cuts down on price or like reduces process like try and find maybe ways that you could basically make yourself a human factors entrepreneur in your own town i think that would be a great way to spend some of your time and really try and apply the skills that you have no matter what level it's coming from whether it's undergrad or master's or phd and make an impact on where you live uh, i think that's a really great thing to do with part of your career and part of your time now in terms of remote remote work this one, in in some ways, will be a little bit more difficult because you're you're again. I still feel like we're in a climate where you're a lot of times having to pitch and make known really what human factors is, unless you're pl- you're applying directly to a job that is like I want a human factors engineer. But from my experience, doesn't mean it's everywhere. Doesn't mean that I have looked and uncovered every stone. But a lot of those jobs want you in that office in the place because you'll be doing things like monitoring products, interacting with users talking to stakeholders, that kind of stuff. So it makes remote a little bit more difficult, but there's plenty of services out there that exist um, like Upwork um, that'll help you kind of get get a nomenclature of like what's out there, what are people looking for that might get you some remote work. Um, if you know of any companies that are looking for it, just start pinging them outright saying like, hey, I have this experience. This is what I know to do as a human factors practitioner. Here's how it can impact your your business or why I fit for the job and go from there. I'm, I'm wondering if that's if they're looking for more than just that. I'm not I'm not really sure. But Nick, your thoughts. Yeah. Being in a rural area is tough. Um, and and, you know, I can see a lot of reasons why somebody might be uh, stuck in a rural area area where perhaps someone uh is you know their significant other is going to school there or something like that where you are ready to progress in your career but they are not um so the first question i i sort of implore you to ask is well why am i here do i do i value this place more than i value my career that's that's a bad question let me let me rephrase that do I is there a specific reason why I'm in this place and then kind of take Blake's approach of saying well is there anything that I can do here um, can I improve the processes and procedures that anyone here is doing in a local town right I know most towns have um, like fresh water facilities or or potentially uh, water reclam- reclamation plants uh, electrical companies like there there are basic utilities in basically every town in the United States, at least, um, in which you can have some sort of impact. It might be tra- tangentially related. If you are planning on, on getting out of that town at some point, that could be a good sort of stepping stone for you to work at, uh, even though it may not be your first choice. Um, places like that, public utilities, I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement with human factors yeah because you were just at sdg and e here in san diego not too long ago right uh the innovation center the yeah. innovation center itself yeah mm-hmm. so the, yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of places that you can look that like i said may not be your first choice but you can still use your human factor skills uh while you're there i will say remote work is getting easier and easier um than it used to be obviously we've talked about different telecommunication um ideas and stories on the show even where the tele the telecommuting is becoming such that you can convey ideas and and uh concepts across the airwaves if you will much more conveniently than you used to be able to and uh through through conferences and through you know shared whiteboards shared documents google docs there's a lot of different ways that you can share the tricky part with that is finding someone that you know that can help get you the in unless you're doing freelance work on a contract by contract basis um which can be kind of soul crushing if you know you don't get consistent work and you need to support 
yourself and potentially others. Yeah, and, and so there's a, there's one more piece, and this is something that I'm I'll unveil now that I'm doing. Uh, so there's there's a company that reached out to me a couple months ago now, and I've been on my like moonlighting in my evenings when I'm not teaching. I'm actually developing kind of coursework that's centered around like research methodology for user experience. Now that's something else you can do as a human factors practitioner because you have a better sense of like how do you analyze something critically from a research perspective. So teaching on something like Skillshare or lynda.com or anything like that, or even developing your own kind of, you know, web presence, whether it's doing a podcast or teaching stuff through YouTube tutorials. There's a lot of ways that you can spend your time to also kind of help you augment who you are and what your skill set is and kind of have, because maybe, maybe in the rural area, you're not able to get as many jobs. Maybe freelancing is tough. And so sometimes you have to be able to show, well, what can you really do? And there's nothing better than having videos of you you know, either teaching something or showing talking methods, human factors, talking yeah. human factors on a weekly podcast or, <laughs> um, you know, any of those kind of things, definitely just start thinking kind of out of the box and maybe think in way, think of ways for passive income. So like teaching a course or starting a podcast, you know, we're raking in that Patreon money. Yeah. We're just killing it with Patreon, killing money. it, killing it. <laughs> We're yeah. making enough to keep the show afloat. That, <laughs> that's, that. that's enough. That is plenty. <laughs> that is enough. And I'm not begging for money, but you know, but YouTube there, subscribers. Yeah, YouTube subscribers. There you go. Yeah, no. The, yeah, Blake's right. You can uh, augment your skill set by by doing some of these other methods to keep you engaged, right? And and to at least provide the proof that you are staying engaged, right? Uh, and if you do start a Human Factors podcast, let us know. We'll jump on the show. We'll, we'll help you kickstart it off. And I, f- I feel like I'm going off down a rabbit hole, but I cannot. But for somebody that is like you and Tori, if you hear this and there's like more specific questions you have, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter again. Um, or Slack, yeah. Slack, or Slack, can, either one. We can be more verbose on Slack, I think. But I, I think something to definitely not downplay is to what Nick said. Like, why are you saying that you're actually bound to some specific place? And once you answer that question, you don't have to tell us. We just I just want to, want you to know the answer to that question. And it's then, an okay. Introspective. If I have to stay here, and there's good reasons to stay here, you definitely want to take advantage of the world we live in now, which is such a social culture where you can meet and network with people online, or even if in your own area you have people that are into human factors or into software development or into app design, starting local chapters of HFES or UXPA, whatever it is, whatever group that you identify with the most and getting people involved, that's another way to really build that circle, help you find work and also like build yourself, build a name for yourself kind of in a social web presence type of way. Blake. Nick. I don't know how we did it. We did a regular show. We did a regular show with only two news stories. I love it. I think it's great. Thank you so much, Tori, for uh, reaching out to us. This is, this was an awesome question. This got us to talk for almost a half an hour about this stuff. So thank you for that. Uh, that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of the news stories this week. We have no after show for the next two weeks while we prep for HFES. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us across any of our social channels at H Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Like I said, we got those bucks rolling in. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my favorite co host for hanging out with me and uh, making his ears and nose bleed from talking to me, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Where can all of our listeners find you if they want to talk to you about uh, bleeding orifices? Oh, about being under pressure. Okay, you guys can always reach me at Don't Panic UX across all social media outlets. Excellent. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.